and uh, Shree's very kindly asked me to talk again, so I've talked on this course a number of times, and I've actually had to change a few slides this year, so we are making some progress. <coughs> so it's a relatively recent thing, this intervention, for <coughs> business. it's, you know, 1996 in terms of medical interventions is new. It started with IV thrombolysis, because we developed IV thrombolysis drugs, and it seemed to work for uh, heart attacks. Uh, and therefore, you know, clot in the brain is the same clot in the heart, perhaps we'll have a go at dissolving it. Um, and of course, everyone's of an age, I think, where we will have to give streptokinase for uh, acute MIs all through the night. Stroke, stroke is the same. But cardiologists worked out that actually opening up the arteries was quicker and more effective than giving IV drugs. And I think it probably is the same. The difference being, as Amrish has alluded to, we have to have tissue that we can salvage. Um, so the history of it all goes through drugs, and we've been through a whole series of drugs over the years, some of which work, some of which don't. They all dissolve clots in vitro, and some of them have a higher hemorrhagic rate than others, but we've pretty much settled on, uh, on RTPA, and these drugs are all, uh, they've all been trialed in, in, in various centers, and they're all derived from uh, recombinant technology, or Ancrod from pit vipers and bats and all sorts of things. So it took a while, but then we got on to mechanical thrombolysis, really in the US in 2004 and, and slightly earlier perhaps in Europe because we're less picky about using devices off license. And I can tell you, for instance, that the device that Amish was referring to, the Solitaire stent, was, has been available for six or seven years with different indications, but it was only licensed by the FDA for stroke use in April of this year, and I was at a meeting in April, and a rep came along and was very excited, so a single hospital in the US ordered, the week after it was licensed, 7,000 stents, <laughs> yeah, 3,000 a housing, so the companies are laughing. But the, the, you know, the US has been behind us, I think. But 2004 to 2012, eight years, not a long time. Uh, and we've been through the same process as drugs, if you like. We've had various things that were, were initially uh, available for using in peripheral arteries, and they were never quite right. They were a bit stiff, they were a bit too big, uh, so they caused complications. And the companies have gradually over the years evolved. We've been through all of these devices. Mercy, of course, was, was shown on telly in um, yeah. <laughs> Fantastically, did well for a few months after that. Um, that was what they used. That was the Mercy original Mercy device. So it's you know it's a corkscrew, it's a pretty rigid thing. You stick it up past the clot, you pull the corkscrew back into the catheter, you pull the hole on out. That was the Mercy device. This was the alligator clip. Again, similar principle. Can you imagine pulling a bit of clot out with that? If you've all seen clot, it's fairly soft and it fragments. It's not. Um, neither of them were particularly successful. But it was a start, so I'm just going to show you. Then we went on to Penumbra, and which it's actually very difficult to show you clot retrieval uh, in as it happens because it, you know, clot isn't radio opaque. It's it's not visible on the imaging. So you you identify where the clot is by injecting contrast. You see where the contrast stops, and then you have to pull the clot out. But it's difficult to show. So I, what I have here is a little video prepared by the makers of Penumbra to sell their device to us and we'll just load up really quickly and it shows you what happens in what they would like to think happens. There we go. So I have to you know, it's taken straight from the company. So you put a catheter up, it's a small micro catheter, you go beyond the clot, you take the wire out, you put up this Nicely deployed thing, it captures all of the clot, nothing flicks off distally. <laughs> you pull, uh, oh, look at that, how does that happen? You, you pull it all back, and whilst you're pulling it back, you inflate a balloon in the ICA, so you've got no blood flow pushing forward, and then you pull the whole thing back, all the way from the brain down into the ICA in the neck, and all those bends, losing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's great, isn't it? <coughs> what have done? And then you put it into the catheter and, and you take it out. 
And, you know, I'm a bit blase. It does work. And I'll show you some cases. It does work. Um, there is no doubt about it. But that catheter is a very big catheter. You know, eight, nine French catheter you've got to put into the ICA. These are generally old patients. They've got atherosclerotic disease. Their arches are rough. Their crosses have stenoses. They're not easy things to put up. So let's just get back to the talk. Um, so we, 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 you know, these, these American West Coast startup companies are very inventive. We have other devices. We have little jets that uh, circulate, create a venturi effect, break up the clot, and they suck out at the same time. Nice theory. Works in animals. Tends to dissect a vessel if you use it in humans. So we've moved away from that. Uh, the Mercy device has moved away. This is a Mercy device as is currently available. So we've moved away from that sort of wrapping thing that wraps around the clot and collects it. We have um, this, which is a suction catheter of different sizes to fit into different vessels. We put it up to the clot, we push this uh, wire through the clot, and there's a little olive on the end there, and we push it in and out gently of the clot, and it breaks up the clot, and at the same time you suck out of the catheter, and it pulls a whole load of stuff back, and, and they do work. We've also gone on to stent. So when all of this was thought about, we had very few devices to put up, but we did have stents. We had coils, we had glue, and we had stents. That's what we had on our shelves. So we tried putting stents up. So you push a stent up into a clot, try and trap the clot in the stent, and pull it back out again. And um, <clears throat> so we, we got stents. And instantly, that company I was telling you about had a stent, and the same stent, exactly the same stent, in a different color box, they were trying to sell us for twice the price for clot retrieval as was available for intracranial stenting for other purposes, usually aneurysm, wall treatment. So, you know, they'll try anything on exactly the same stent. And, and there are whole meetings on stents. We can talk about stent design, delivery method, self-expanding, balloon expandable, what metal they're made of, steel, nice and all, what the... Um, cells are like open and closed, or the ratio of metal in the wall to the hole. So, you know, there's a massive new development research area now about stents for, for clot uh, extraction, and that's, and that's one of the things we're going. Uh, and essentially, we are in a position now where we can retrieve clots. We have got a history of IV thrombolysis, which we know works. Intraarterial thrombolysis does work in those acute settings where I know that I've created a clot if I'm doing neurointerventional procedure. I know I can dissolve it with a high thrombolysis. It's soft, acute clot. It will go. Not so much relevant for people with stroke, but it, it, it is available. We have devices and we have a combination. So we're into combination treatment pretty much at the moment. As Amory said, pretty much everyone will have some degree, usually their bolus of high thrombolysis before they come into vascular lab. Um, so pictures, you, you've been through the pictures. Um, the trials have, um, we'll come to trials in a minute. So here is someone with a basilar artery thrombus. I'm not gonna show you the Frankenmore pictures. They had the uh, appropriate clinical picture. You can see on the plain CT, no infarct, but a dense basilar artery. Silly pictures, we've got a CTA. So there's the basilar artery, there's clots in it. You can see the PCAs are filling there from the peak on. So over the top of the basilar syndrome in this patient, take them to the angio room. So AP and lateral views of a vertebral artery ejection, that's your left foot, that's your right foot, there's your basilar artery in the front, in the side, you can see a clot there, no blood going out beyond it. In this case, it was a penumbra device, so the, the, the vacuum cleaner type thing, and you know, 30 seconds later, it's open. I can't show you it working, but there, there was a clot there. Now it's all gone, there's still a little bit that's been pushed up there. You can see and we can have a little go at going out to that as well. Although, I know that if you leave a PCA with a clot there, they generally don't infarct. So they're generally quite well, so I didn't go after it too vigorously. Probably 2008, I'm guessing. Uh, yeah, so there we go. We can push the catheter up to the PCA and try and get that clot out if we think it's appropriate. Um, and here she is, 24 hours post-procedure. She's got a little bit of high signal intensity change in her pons, but no infarct. DWI, she was perfect, absolutely nothing on the third part of this clinic. Uh, here's another, you know, 
numbers that they're terrible and they are terrible, but someone with an MCA, uh, I think. So what you're looking at there is an angiogram, uh, frontal view, and internal clotted injection, and it looks a bit bizarre. That's the PCOM, the PCA that's fitting there. There should be a middle cerebral artery there, that's the anterior temporal artery. There should be a big artery there that's supplying all that bit of brain, but it's not there. Uh, so when we're doing IV thrombolysis, uh, sorry, intra-arterial thrombectomy, we need to know that that vessel is patent beyond the clot. All right? We cannot fish clot out of all of this vessel. We have to show it's patent. We need to know the clot is in that very short segment of M1. So we will go past the clot with our catheter and inject contrast, and we show that all these vessels are nice and patent and healthy looking. In that case, it's worth going after the clot. And Again, with a mixture of devices and intra-arterial thrombectomy, you can see that little stump is coming back, and eventually you can, open, you can, you can sort of get the idea, someone's leaning on the lights, <coughs> uh, that there's a sort of lozenge there, clot. Don't forget, <coughs> these generally are not forming in situ, they've come from somewhere else, they're a mixture of stuff. There'll be a bit of hard, sometimes plaque material that's come off a of a plaque and the ICA or sometimes from the heart and then often as it blocks there's soft material around it so it's a mixture of both so you can dissolve the clot with uh, the soft component with the intra-arterial thrombolysis but the hard fragments you need to pull out so there's a little lozenge there and you keep working on it getting smaller <coughs> keep nibbling it away keep going now the perforators have come back and there we are so it was just this vessel open at the beginning this one is open now as long as you've got a reasonable flow through it, it will tend to, um, the brain will survive and the um, artery will tend to regain normal, its normal uh, caliber. And a few little infarcts, but nothing major really in that patient. But there are other diseases, don't forget. So this is someone with a, so CTA and MRA, time of flight MRA, so a very healthy right ICA vertebral basilar, and on the left here there is no flow demonstrated in that segment of the vessel. Don't forget it's a time of flight technique, so if it was occluded you wouldn't see any flow up there. The fact that you've got no flow here but you are seeing flow there means something. Some of those spinning uh, protons are getting through, so there is a very tight stenosis there. Um, symptomatic patient, so very tight stenosis, must have something wrong with him. There are other stenoses as well, but if you could increase the perfusion to the brain, they generally do better. You don't need to tackle all of those things. So <coughs> that's pre-procedure, that's post-procedure. You wouldn't know it's there. And that patient, again, stopped having symptoms from uh, that stenosis. You can, you can just about make it out. Make it by view, a little step there. Um, <coughs> so the biggie, looking through all our data, it's very interesting, actually. Almost everyone we've done has been a right MCA occlusion. I don't know why. I only worked an hour this week. We'll have to go back and see if there's a reason for that. But most of them are MC, right MCA occlusions rather than left. But there's a the classic dense MCA. Um, the patient is intubated. They have to be intubated. That creates a degree of delay in the whole process. Uh, pretty picture. Reverse, I'm afraid. So MCA occlusion there. Uh, and this is the sort of the nub of the thing, as Amrish was saying, is we have to know that there is salvageable brain. There is no point in fishing a clot out of an MCA in someone whose whole hemisphere is infarcted. Okay, so we would always look at these images, and it's the same data sets as he's been looking at. So that's the CBB, that's what you're looking at first. There's the core infarct. And if I flick up and down through those images, you will see that there is a relatively, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong side, aren't I? Yeah, it's the right, it's the right hemisphere we're looking at, and there's a relatively small core infarct, okay? So there's a basal ganglia have gone, and a little bit higher up, there's a little bit of posterior frontal or parietal cortex that was affected, but there's an absolutely massive perfusion defect. So there's a large mismatch. There is also ischemia on the other side, but that was clinically silent. Um, so large right hemisphere to save. Um, if I show you that, you probably can't quite see the names up there, but that's three o'clock. Okay, that's the time that the CTA was done, and this is 4:24. Okay, 
right? So it's an hour and a half. That's how long it takes us, and it's pretty much the same in every case. It takes us an hour and a half to work out that someone needs thrombolysis to have them on the table. Okay? And actually, you can subtract five minutes from that, and that's the time it takes from making a country and drawing together capital there or less. So it's good, it's a long time. And the reasons for that are manifold. We don't have anesthetists hanging around in that. <coughs> imaging department waiting for these. We don't have an empty room. You know, neuroradiologists are usually around somewhere. The nurses are often busy. So this is something we need to work on if we're going to offer this sort of service. But that's another thing. But again, MCA cut off. We've got the perforators are all still there. So the basal ganglia should be intact. This patient should be doing quite well. Same principle, put the catheter beyond the clot, make sure the vessels are all patent. In this case, it was a stent retriever, so there are three little markers on the distal end of the stent. There's three little markers on the proximal end of the stent. What you do is you deploy, this, deploy the stent across the clot and wait. Let the, clot ex so the stent expand through the clot, capture all the clot, wait for five minutes. And don't forget, it doesn't matter that you're waiting because you've obviously got perfusion. You reopen that vessel so the brain is being perfused. You can wait roughly five minutes, and then you pull the whole thing out. Uh, that's um, obviously an unsubtracted view, and pristine, nothing distal, no clot. Okay, and it, it you know it does work like that. If you pick the cases, it does work like that. So 1424, 1447 takes about 20 minutes. Um, and this is his scan afterwards. There's a little bit of hemorrhagic change in his basal ganglia, but the whole hemisphere that looked very ischemic hasn't infarcted at all. Again, did very well. And the other hemisphere, where we could see clinically silent infarct, uh, is going to go on to have an infarct. Um, so there is a foc you know, there's a focus. Uh, we'll come on to that. So things that we can't do, or things that make it more difficult, as Amory says, you've got a CTA. You have <coughs> vessels. If you've got a really tight stenosis of your ICA, that's much harder to get past. You may need to stand that on the way. That adds to the time of the whole procedure, adds to the complication rates. You know, you have to balance all of these things <coughs> together. Another patient with a nice ICA, tight stenosis of his ICA, you're not going to get catheters past that. That has to be treated before and you get to the brain, so it adds time. Calcified vessels with tight stenoses, you can't. You know, whereas you could stent or angioplasty a tight stenosis in a vessel without calcification. <coughs> you've got, that's obviously the, so the uh, 3D view, but if you look at it in the proper CT, you've got almost circumferential calcium and a tiny little lumen. If you try an angioplasty or stent that, you will rupture the vessel. It's just not worth trying. So again, those are things you can't treat. Um, Charles Stent, who gave his name to the stent, retrievers. That's what we're at, stent retrievers. That's our new name for these things that we're putting in people's heads. Uh, who, what, when, how? Well, I think most people are either using a penumbra or stent retriever, which is really just the stent. Uh, we have to work out who to treat uh, and when to treat them. And the numbers are going up. The two busiest centres in the UK are Stoke-on-Trent and Bristol. This is this came from about six months ago. Uh, and They'd done 50 that year by then, and they were doing about three a month. We did three last month as well. So the numbers are definitely going up. Uh, it is costly. Okay, the, the, the equipment, <coughs> consumables, add up to about £4,000. Uh, you need to have an anaesthetist. Someone's got to pay for an anaesthetist. Uh, it's, not, it's just not worth trying to do these people awake. Okay, no one does it. They, it hurts fiddling around in someone's MCA for this pain and then they move but there's nothing worse than having you know trying to work through someone's head and, and have them move around. You need to have the equipment that needs to be available. I'd say you have to have intervention in your radiologists and then they have to be available to do it. <coughs> so in our unit we have three neurointerventionists, you know that's about half the UK, some of them will have four, occasionally five. It's not enough to provide a 24-7 service. We can't do it. Uh, fortunately, strokes aren't like MIs. They don't tend to turn up in the middle of the night. They tend to be more day. So perhaps an eight to eight is the best we can do in the short term. Um, <coughs> the complication rates for well-chosen cases are relatively low. 
there is a learning curve to doing all of this, so you have to get through that. The angiographic success rate is very high. The clinical success rate, of course, is another issue, and that's what we really need to focus on. Um, as of yet, there are no, there's no decent randomized controlled trial. These are all four European trials from four different countries. PEAST has now been agreed to be funded in the UK. Uh, Mr. Clean is a Dutch trial that's very similar to the PEACE trial, which compares intra-arterial thrombectomy with IV. And the Dutch running theirs in France and Italy, they have been running for longer, but they aren't recruiting. The French are uh, much more <coughs> pro-mechanical thrombectomy than intravenous thrombolysis, so they can't recruit <coughs> their trial. And the Italian trial, I don't know what's happened to it, to be honest. IMS3. Uh, <coughs> was recently stopped, so IMS3 reported futility, I don't like that word, but it used the word futility uh, of intra-arterial thrombectomy versus best medical management, and therefore recruitment was stopped. That was in April of this year. Uh, but it is. it was the first trial, it started in 2006, it, 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 therefore its protocol was written in 2004, and it included no advanced imaging techniques. It was entirely a clinical decision as to whether or not to send them to intravenous or mechanical thrombectomy. And as Amrish has said, there's a huge difference between someone with an M1 clot and a brain that's dead, that we know, on a CBV or diffusion, and someone with an M1 occlusion with a small core infarct and a large amount of salvageable tissue. So it was, uh, it didn't show any benefit, but I, I think. You know, most of us who do it, and we don't like being disturbed at random times of the day to go and do these things, so we're not particularly proactive about doing it. We can see that there's a huge advantage to selective patients. Their NIHS SS scores come down very significantly before and after treatment. So the IMS trial was run by uh, the neurology uh, person running was Dr. Boderick from US, and, and he wrote an editorial in. JAMA last year and read it, but basically what it says is that in the past, physicians were focusing on opening vessels and not the clinical outcome. And that, and that in a new technique is probably not unreasonable. You've got to be able to, in order to get a trial going, you have to be able to show that you can open the vessel, then you can start looking at clinical outcomes. So it definitely was the focus many years ago and probably was the focus when this trial was, the IMS3 trial was conceived. <coughs> we are now moving on to clinical outcomes. We, you know, modified ranking score, NIHSS, stroke scales, everything is reported for all our patients. So we are much more focused on outcome and advanced imaging. But he was right in that we are focusing. So he runs IMS3. He started in 2006 and he wrote this editorial in last year. He probably knew that IMS3 was not going to show much of a difference between the interarterial uh, thrombectomy and the um, IV thrombolysis arms. The PEAST trial was originally going to include uh, more advanced imaging uh, data uh, to be used in patient selection, but that has been taken out of the trial protocol. So we may end up running a trial that's very similar to this that isn't going to show much benefit, which would be sad, really. Uh, so that's what I've said. The IMS3 trial was run by the same guy who wrote that quite uh, widely read editorial in JAMA last year. So here we are, Asher. We're all walking around in circles, pushing uphill and getting nowhere. And that's where we are. We need some good data. Uh, we can do it, but we have to select the right patients. Thank you.